jump into it. Cool. Uh, yep, I'm Dave, talking about <laughs> FRP with events and behavior. <coughs> yep, all good. Oh, all good. What, yep, that's my radius. Cool. Um, so, I'm talking about true FRP in quotes. Truish FRP. Uh, true enough. Uh, <laughs> Uh, True-ish FRP has events and behaviors. It has denotational semantics. That means you can determine the meaning of your program and you can compose programs and you can kind of compose the meaning. So your reasoning scales, which is nice. It has the ability to handle continuous time. That's where the ish part comes in because Connell Elliott kind of wants that to be very, very first class and a lot of the library authors don't. But they still claim they can model continuous time and that's enough to give you sampling rate independence, which is what Connell wants, so it's good enough for me, so I'll, I'll take that ish. Um, so what do we get? We get composable systems of time with of time varying state and logic. Uh, sounds like just buzzwords for now, but it'll make more sense as we go. Uh, we're looking at reactive banana today. Uh, it's a fairly old, well, mature library for events and behaviors. Uh, part two will cover Reflex, which is newer, it's more performant, and has some nice little bits and pieces to it. Sodium is also worth looking at. The FRP book published by Manning uh, is out and it's great. All the examples are in Java, so they're pretty wordy, but there's a Scala version, there's a TypeScript version, there's a C Sharp version, all using you know, the same words and the same semantics, so you can and you know, translate your thinking around all over the place. There was a Haskell version deprecated in favor of reactive banana because the APIs converged so close that there was no point. So, cool. And they've got an awesome sense of humor in that book. It's, yeah, it's well worth it. Cool. Let's look at events. Uh, in reactive banana, uh, we have a data type for events with a type parameter, and we have a functor instance for it. So far, so good. Events fired at infinitely thin logical points of time, uh, like, like button presses or keystrokes, they, they happen. Uh, this gets thrown around a little bit as the semantics for it, and that's like a list of pairs of times and values, uh, where time's taken to be increasing in this case. And, uh, there's probably some time traveling FIP out there, but I don't even want to know about it. <laughs> um, they're push based, it'll come up later, but it means that you know if in one event, causes another event to fire, that's kind of the dominant flow of things that comes into play with garbage collection. And we'll get there. Each firing event is at a new logical point in time. So when you press a key, you get an event. And they kind of get linearized as you go from the real world to your event network. There can be multiple different events active at the same logical point in time, which sounds like a contradiction. If they're each at a unique point in time, how do you have multiple events? Well, the functor instance demonstrates the happening at the same point in time. Uh, here we have something where the flip function changes red to blue and blue to red. We have our input along the top and we have map flip, we just flip the colors. The outputs are happening at the same logical points in time as the inputs. <laughs> uh, we can use fmap const, just set things to blue. We'll do that quite a bit, so that little if map ish <coughs> symbol there is what to watch out for. And there are functions to filter and split events as well. So we can, uh, in that case, it'll be the same logical points of time, but possibly less of them. Uh, so we can filter to just have the red events. Uh, in this case, we have our inputs. Uh, the outputs are just the red ones with filter E. Um, if anyone wants me to slow down, just sing out. Uh, and we can split. If we have an event of either A or B, we can split into the left and right and end up with two outputs where you know, the left ones correspond to the things with left, the right ones with right. Yeah. Um, and we need to be aware of the potential for these simultaneous events when we combine them. Uh, so union width is used for combining them. If it takes two event inputs. If they're firing on their own, then they just become the output. If they fire together, we use the mixing function. And here I've done that with colors. Um, so you can see when input one is firing on its own, that's just the output. Thing. I'll move your laptop over. Yeah. Just keep talking. Yep. Uh, if input two is firing on its own, then you just get the blue output. But if they fire together, then it mixes the colors. Uh, cool. 
Uh, and we can use this uh, to build something when we don't really care about simultaneous events. We just have a, a whole heap of them. We just want whatever's happening right now. Uh, and in other libraries, that's called leftmost. We don't really care about the implementation. It just takes a list of events. And whichever one is firing right now in, in the leftmost position in the list is the one that we take. Uh, so basically, along the top of this graph here, uh, there aren't some of the inputs, but you know, if one thing's firing, then that's the output. But if two things are firing, it's whichever one's earlier in the list. So we can give some kind of priority order. So there'll be plenty of examples of this as we go through. But let's bookmark it for now. And we've got some other things that we'll look at later, like unions that combines events and functions. Cool. So let's build an event network. Uh, we'll start off with a little helper. It kind of filters events. Uh, this event of ints will be filtered based on whether it's a multiple event. Cool. All right, now we go to work. So we have our input, which is a counter, an event of integers. And then we have an output that fires whenever that input is a multiple of three. And we have another, we have another event that fires when the input is a multiple of five. And now, we, if they happen simultaneously, we combine the two of them. <laughs> cool. All right, so th this is just an event network. It's on the inside. There's no firing of things yet. In order to fire things, we need to be able to build a bridge between the inside and the outside. And that's where new ad handler comes in. It creates two parts of the puzzle. On the left, the ad handler is used to register for events on the inside of the network. And the function on the right causes them to happen. It's an IO function you use on the outside. Uh, you fire it away, and things go. So we can kind of wrap that up to make it a little bit neater. So we have a fire function for the outside, the register of events from the inside. Uh, but before we can use that, um, this is going to be the first thing that gives us new points in time. So previously, in functors, the outputs happen at the same time as the inputs. Well, how does the first event happen? What point in time does that happen at? Uh, it happens whenever there's a firing. That's where we get our new points in time. Uh, there are exactly as many observable logical points in time as there are firings from the outside. Uh, how do we know we're dealing with a function that plays with these things? It'll have moment or moment I.O. in the context, depending on whether or not it does I.O. Uh, it's kind of like a builder monad for the event network, but it also indicates that we're doing stuff outside of the current moment in time. Uh, in the sodium literature, they're referred to as transactions. <coughs> that can help make sense of them a little bit. And we're doing it, we're focusing right on right now the events that are firing. We're talking about the, the various outputs that, that will occur, and that happens kind of at all points simultaneously. So, from the inside of the event network, we register the event handler, and that will give us events at, you know, once we wire those events into the network. So the moment I.O. builds the network that gives us the event. And then to make things happen, if we have an event of an I.O. action, uh, we can use reactimate <coughs> to make that go. Uh, so let's put this bad boy together. Uh, we have our important work in the middle, and now we register for uh, inputs from the outside, and we do our printing uh, down the bottom with the React events. So far, so good. Uh, but we need to actually make it happen. We need to do the stuff from the outside and in our firings. So for a particular integer, because we want an increase in count, uh, we can pass the integer in, we fire it, and then we wait a second. And then we can just do that forever, you know, zero and onwards. And here's our usual boilerplate, where we look it all up. We create our event sources. We use that to build our uh, network description. That gets compiled. It gets started up. And then the event loop goes. This will be pretty similar in every reactive demand application, right? However, we're doing that counting outside of the network. And if we can't count, then you know, what good is FRP? Is that limited? So this is what we want for our loop. We want something that just ticks files off a clock tick every second, and then we deal with the counting on the inside. To do that, we need our first uh, function that gives us some form of state. 
So the QME function, uh, QME delayed events, starts with a value. Every time the event fires, it applies the function in the event to our little uh, state. Uh, here's an example of it where uh, we start with red, and every time we get an input, we flip the, um, the state of our color. Just, okay. And here's how we do a counter. Every time we hit increment, we add one. Uh, we never see the zero because the output is the same, occurs simultaneously with the input. Uh, the first time we see it is when the first event is applied to it. It's just giving us a baseline. Cool. Uh, this is as good a place as any to talk about the difference between leftmost and unions, uh, those functions that are dealt with lists of events. Uh, so if we have two events, uh, increment and double, and we run leftmost here, we can see we have one simultaneous event, and where the two of them occur, it will pick the first thing in the left, which the thing that's firing at the leftmost position. Uh, so that's why we go from one to two. We, we add one, we don't double it. Uh, with unions, it actually composes them, where they're simultaneous, and it composes them from the bottom to the top. So in this case, where increment and double fire at the same time, it doubles the one, and then adds one to get to three. So that's unions versus leftmost. But anyhow, we can count now. So by accumulating events, and so we'll oh, we'll add that in. Uh, we'll change from an event source of ints that we're coming from the outside to an event source of just ticks, and then we add them all. Cool. All right. Now let's do something slightly more serious than FizzBuster, but not much more serious. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be echoing user input for the time being. So, pretty simple. Our event loop is pretty basic, right? We get a line, fire that, continue. Uh, and our initial version of the, the whole network is pretty simple. We register for read events, they become our write events, <coughs> we put them on the screen. And, well, let's modify this. Let's add the ability to quit. So, we now filter our reads to make sure that they're not the quit command, slash quit. Then we add in something to check if it was quit, and that's our quit message. And then if we get a quit, then we call exit success and we're out of there. It's a terrible way to do it. Uh, there, are, there are nicer ways to kill things, fitting them on a slide, and it's a big digression. Just exit success, get out of it. Cool. Uh, we'll add a parting message. Yeah. So this is what we had. We'll add an event for our writes. So we're going to have multiple sources for our writes, but they're all going to get concentrated here. We update our output to make use of it. And then we use leftmost, because none of them are going to be simultaneous, to use a message if it was a message, or print our little exit message if we quit. Yeah. All right. We had a parting. Let's add a greeting for symmetry. <coughs> We need an open event to kick things over, so we make a little data structure for that and a helper to build it. Uh, and we modify our event loop. We fire the open event and then we start firing free lines. Ah, and now we just need to make use of it. So we update our input so that we have access to our input sources for open and opening events and reading events. Uh, we register the open events, and then we add them into our output. Cool. Right, we're building some momentum here. We'll add a help command. Uh, we've got a little help message string. It kind of doesn't do much, but it's all right. Uh, and now we need to change our filter to get to e-message, because we're going to have multiple potential commands. So we take the first character and make sure it's in a slash, and then we can check the help message, and then print it out when it happens. And the last thing we want to do is deal with unknown commands. They type in slash foo, and we don't know what foo is. We probably don't want to just silently eat that. Uh, we've got a little helper function. We'll have lots of little pure helper functions throughout this that are splits things into either messages or commands. It starts with a slash, take the rest, that's a command, put it on the right. Otherwise, put it on the left, you have a message. Cool. 
And then if it's an unknown command, we distinguish between it was an empty command versus an unknown command. We tell them to type in help so they know what's going on. Cool. Um, so this is what we had before, we spaced out. Uh, we now split our read into messages and commands. Uh, we update our commands to get in the command path, and we edit the string. And then you know, we just check if the command isn't something that we're expecting, uh, then we tell the user about it. Cool. So that's a basic program, a tricked out echo. Uh, but it's somewhere to start, right? Uh, normally it's pretty easy to just change things around in FRP. There's very little said about what to change it towards. Uh, Basically, you're going to get examples like that all over the web, and that's kind of, it, it's dumped fully formed, and it might use recursive do's, and things refer to themselves, and you just stare at it for a while and kind of hope that inspiration strikes for where you, you know, what am I heading towards? And you're like, ah, you're heading towards a mess. <laughs> so let's make this less messy. It's not, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, it's just something you might like to try, gives you some ideas. Uh, we'll look at some options. First things first, let's separate out that I.O. Uh, so our initial, uh, we create a data structure, holds our events, and we just do our registration just in a separate piece. Register the events, return the events. And we do the same with the outputs. Here are our output events, and we do our reactimating. All good. And then, if we're given some kind of network that is pure, it doesn't use moment I.O., using those input events and those output events, uh, this will lift it up back to what we had before. Cool. We handle our inputs, that does the IO inputs. We make use of our um, network. Uh, lift moment is part of uh, the monad moment type class, which allows things to work in either moment or moment IO, and we handle our outputs. Cool. So we'll change this over to the new form. So we have our input sources. Uh, we get rid of them, and now we have input IO, which gives us access to the two events, so we don't have to register anything anymore. It's the input IO gone. Uh, and we return moment output IO, and that just uh, gives us a return of just this pure structure here. We don't need the moment context, but it works with our little helper there, which makes things a bit more reasonable. That's why it's got the dodgy return, rather than just being a pure function. Cool. And if we want to keep all the names you know, lined up with what we had before, then we can add a little prime and then wrap it up using the main member. Oh. All right, so we had this. This was our previous block diagram. And now we have this. Written on a train, photo on the way in. I haven't written anything for ages, so if you can't read it, come up nice and close and you still won't be able to read it. <laughs> uh, but we're still dealing with things in terms of I.O., right? We've got an open and a read, and they correspond directly to I.O. events. And same with write and close. So, domain-specific events for our complex echo domain. Uh, data structure, you know, all of the various things that we care about. And this is the code we had before. It separates it out. It takes us from our I.O. events to our domain-specific events. Uh, we'll do something similar for the outputs. We could really care strongly about, ooh, if a message write and a help write are simultaneous, what order do we put them in? And we have something like this. If you're prototyping, however, you can do something like this. Here are all my writes, here are all my closes. And then your fan in just does the right thing with all of them. So if you have a lot of writes that happen at once, you just connect them all up with new lines. If you have a whole of closes, just take the leftmost one because closing twice, you don't want to do it a lot of the time. Uh, a butchered version of this, because it wouldn't fit in the slides unless I really shrunk my event names, but there's helpful little locks there. I mean, it's just leftmost, a whole heap of fmaps. It's the inputs and the outputs are pretty direct. But it's a simple program, and now we have a simple network sitting in the middle. Uh, and we can wrap that up with a similar helper and then more primes and whatnot. So. Cool. So, another dodgy diagram. We now have this. We have our fan out, which goes from IO to the domain. We have a fan in, which goes from domain to IO. And we have a block in the middle. Uh, 
we have another option here. Instead of having our product of events, our big list of events, we could have one event with it some time. Uh, and we can convert backwards and forwards between them. We have the pieces that we need. It's great for testing. So reactive banana comes with this testing function, interpret, which takes an event, a single event of some type. Uh, and uh, if you pretty that up a little, okay, there we go. Uh, this is the kind of thing that it gives you. You can give it you know, just for when things fire, nothing's when it's calm, and it will give you your outputs. So you can see that if I type in quit, I get the buy message and the close simultaneously at the same time, which is possibly what we wanted. If that's a surprise, then we go back and fix that. Uh, we can also do it with the domain events. So we can test both of them to see that things are ticking along well. Uh, but using a product of events is good for decomposing things. So rather than a single event, we use a whole heap of them, and we can break things apart and have better block diagrams. And so, because everyone writes a big ball of mud, I'm going to go the other way and do something equally bad in the other direction. <laughs> everything gets two data types and a function. I'm breaking everything up into little components that are reusable and encapsulate their little strings. We have our input, we have our output, we have our thing that handles it. And, like, some of it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> This just takes an event in and passes it back out. We have the ID function in seven lines of code. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we can build on that later, and we've got a little box that we can just put things in. Um, so we build all of these things up, and now we have this. And now our description is all our little components talking to each other. And we have our known inputs and our known outputs, and we can wire things together. And, you know, obligatory dodgy internals of you know what's going on there, but we have boxes and that's what we care about if we're going down this path. Alright. Well, how are we going for time? It's a words. Good question. Uh, it's almost six thirty. It's four minutes to six thirty. I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, right, yeah, I'll get into it. So we've done events. Events are just things that fire and cause other things to fire and they just click. Behaviors are where things get interesting. Behavior has an applicative instance along with its functor instance. This allows some good things just on its own. They have a value at every point in time. It doesn't care whether you mention the point in time, every point in time is covered. The semantics are given, you know, it's like a function from time to a value. If you squint, you can kind of view that as, it's like state. State has something initially and then you change it and its value changes at various points in time. It's not normally quite as explicit about the points in time where things like that happen. <coughs> uh, it'll all make sense. Uh, they're pull based. Uh, one behavior will reference another and it kind of pulls data towards it. Again, the garbage collection section will make that a bit clearer. Uh, some of the time you use them to model state. Some of the time you use them as inputs to functions to act as a live variable. You know, if you've got a settings page and it's passing in a number, you're just passing the behavior, uh, and then if something changes it, you don't care where, and you know, multiple things may change it in the future, but you've got, you know, I've got my setting, I'll be able to determine when it changes, or its value when I need it. Uh, we'll see that as well. So, we build behaviors with events. Uh, stepper starts with a value. Every time the event occurs, it takes on the event's value. But it takes on the event's value in the next moment of time. So uh, when this red event happens here, uh, the behavior stays blue until the very next uh, point in time in the system. So we don't observe the change until, you know, we can't observe the change as it happens. We observe it afterwards. So we start with blue, and then we just take on the value of our events. Uh, we sample behaviors with events. We can use the bottom form if we just want to use the event as the point in time we're interested in. And the top form, let's just use the value of the event in there. And the syntax looks a little bit funky until you see it in use. Like this. This behavior has applicatives. We can combine multiple behaviors and then throw the value of the event on there. It gives us the point in time in which we want uh, the behaviors to be sampled, 
then we get the value of the heavy one, the value of the PA into the value of the event combined into the three argument function. And in the bottom form, we just don't care about the value of the event. We just want to sample those two behaviors at that particular point in time. So where stepper is, if I go back a little, it's kind of like collecting all of your puts in the state monad into one spot, because events can be firing at all points in time under various conditions. You could, in theory, go through and get every put that occurs to your state monad and combine it into one event. And then one call to stepper will do all of the updates at the right time. Whereas your sample is kind of like combining all of your gets. Now you don't have to combine all of them because these things can pose. You can do all of my gets under this condition and sample it, and then under some other condition you combine all of them. Yeah, because the events fire multiple times, this is multiple samplings of behavior and giving you something which fires multiple, you know, the outputs at all of those times. Cool. Uh, ah, and here's an example of uh, using the little mixy sample syntax thing. So we have our behavior, a whole heap of colors. Uh, we have an event, which is also a whole heap of colors. And then we're using uh, the mix function. We get outputs whenever the event is firing, and then it mixes the color of the behavior and the event that are inputs. Yep. Uh, at no other times than the uh, event input. Typically, these kind of functions, you only have one event in the API, because there's only one point of time that you deal with. And we can use the tagging version to just grab the color we don't care about. So that's the equivalent of fmap const in behavior land. All right, uh, we can filter events using behaviors. We have a behavior bool. We can use that as a time varying gate for things. Uh, like so, where the dark color is true, we just filter out our events based on our time varying boolean. Uh, that can be quite handy. All right, time for an example. <coughs> Dumped lots of code and API. Login and log out events, giving us a logged in or logged out state. <coughs> if we log in, we change to the logged in state. If we log out, we change to the logged out state. If we start as logged out. Anytime we grab that, possibly at other points in time, we can find out whether we're logged in or logged out. Cool, cool. Now all that error handling. Um, this would be a great place to spot that stuff shortly. Alright, cool. Yeah. Uh, now we add error handling so you can't log in if you're already logged in, and you can't log out if you're already logged out. It will give us an error on the left side of the either. And otherwise, it'll tell us the new state on the right side of the either. Cool? All right. Then we add recursive do. No. Which is why you're going to need pizza in a minute. <laughs> All right. We have our two functions. We want a behavior giving us our logged in state. And we want an event if there's an error. So we'll always be able to work out a logged in state. If there's an error, then something will be firing, so we can print a message or tell the user. That's cool. We have mdo rather than do. This recursive do is in play. I'm not going to tell you what it is, that'll be my little surprise, and then you get pizza. So, to begin with, we use stepper. Starting in the logged out state, changing on some event, it'll give us our logged in state, right? So if we put in the right event, that will give us the logged in state. That's okay. That's how that's, we're half done. It's one of our inputs. Ooh. Cool. Now we add in our, we use our login and logout functions with our login and logout events, but we sample the logged in state on the way because that determines whether we get an error or not. We combine both of those functions with leftmost, and then we split them so that the errors are on the left and the login state is on the right. But the errors on the left, we're after the errors. We're almost done. Now we just need to fill in those question marks. Oh, that's it, right? We've got one of them. It's the login state. <laughs> that is recursive do. Uh, in reactive banana, it is always safe to have value recursion where a behavior depends on an event or event depends on a behavior. You can just go to town, and people do. But, yeah, so that's the tamest example of recursive do that I can come up with. And, yeah, you'll see it all the time, uh, various functions aren't primitive, they can be defined using other primitive functions in recursive do, but don't look at them too hard because that's in an abstract form and yeah, yeah, it gets a little wild. Cool. Um, that's probably as good a place as any to stop for pizza. 
I'm believe you need your cousin to do a full pizza. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's very intense for the first time. Alright, so we've crossed the chasm of uh, recursive do with the basic behavior. So uh, now we're going to do something in our Echo app, just to you know, make use of it in our running example. And we had our little joke message thing before, which has had an event in and an event out. Uh, it's now going to track message history. So this is abusing the fact that when we use stepper to accumulate state, its result isn't available until the next event. And so if we sample, if we build it with the message and sample it with the message, we're going to get the last value out of it because it hasn't changed yet. So the messages holds the last message. Uh, we sample it and we can print it out. And we'll be printing out our last message from the new message. The one message is boring. <laughs> this is where a QMB comes in. Accumulate things into a behavior. It is very, very similar to accumulating into events. Uh, here is a little example of it. It starts as red, and it flips the state every time an event happens. So every time there's an event, in the next point in time, it'll flip from red to blue or blue to red. Uh, it's actually the same as the accumulate event example, except the value keeps on keeping on in between events. Cool. All right. So let's grab all of the messages. So uh, we use our accumulate B, and then we just grab the message and throw it onto the front of our history list. Uh, and we change our format method to be able to handle it. Oh, and we're done. We're just printing out all the messages we ever received. Uh, but it prints previous message empty list when there's no previous message. <coughs> so we can fix that up as well. <clears throat> so here's our gather all the history forever. And now we can work out whether we actually have messages in the history. We just fmap not null over it, and we have <coughs> a behavior of bools. And then we can use when e, which works with behavior of bools, to give us e message with history, uh, which we use. We only ever format it when there's a message with history. And if there isn't, we fall through to regular message using leftmost. They're happening simultaneously, but one of them isn't happening all the time. Cool. We should trim that history a little, because unbounded growth is typically frowned on. So, we have this. Hey, we're bounded. <laughs> um, we do the trimming inside the creation of the behavior, so we don't have an infinite behavior around, and then take three off it and say that we've trimmed things. Uh, that doesn't help anyone at all. And the hard-coded three is a bit of a problem. So uh, what we're going to do is have a non-hard-coded three, but we're going to go down a little digression where we build a component that, you know, from your settings page or whatever, that handles your history message limit. So you know, there's two arrows on your setting page, go up, go down, and our output is the limit. Uh, dodgy version of what we're aiming for, <laughs> uh, blue for behaviors. You can see that. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where we're using unions. Uh, accumulate event and accumulate behavior both use endo functors in the events, and unions builds endo functors out of a list of endo functors mm -hmm. by composing them all together. Yeah. Not that we really have simultaneous things here. If the user can click on up and down at once, then it's all them. Right. So we start simple. We, you know, if they press up, when you use the successor function to increase the limit. If they press down, we decrease it, but we make sure it doesn't go below zero. And we use a chemical <coughs> behavior to keep hold of the limit. Uh, we can bring recursive doing, because why not? Uh, so we start with this and make a new event that basically tells us when they press down and when the limit is larger than zero. And then we make use of that new event so we don't have to have the max there. It says up and down. Hey! Uh, and then the maintenance programmers find us and kill us in our sleep. Um, or we could have both an event and a behavior for the limit, which I'll explain uh, after I've gone through the code. So rather than just having behavior as the output, we have the event. Uh, we had this. 
we had this thing in here. It's special source, you see the interactive banana uh, examples. And then we use the map acume function, which kind of does a crazy scan that will give you a behavior, an event that tells you when the behavior is changing. Uh, you can do other things with map acume. It doesn't appear in many examples. Really, you go for it when you want the event and the behavior. It can lead to some efficiency wins. Uh, if you come, if you play with reflex, if you go ahead, they have a dynamic, which is which was a pair of events and behaviors. It's now something a little more efficient. And the reason they have the dynamic is that the events in, re in reflex are purely push-based, and the behaviors are purely pull-based. You need to use like if you just have a behavior of your DOM on your page, you're going to have to be without an event to tell you when it changes. You're going to have to pull that continuously in order to work it and update it. If you, they use the event to tell it when to pull so that you catch it when it changes, but the behavior can fall and sit around and so other things can access the state. It's, a, it's actually a pretty decent setup. So sometimes efficiency wins. It's cheaper than using a accumulate event and accumulate behavior on individual lines. It's, it can be more efficient. Uh, so just worth noting really, and set up for part two. So we have a behavior in coming out of this thing. We have a limit, which tells us what a history limit is. We don't have to know anything more about it. There could be a second source that can change it, and they will get combined somewhere, and then we get the behavior in. Other things can affect it. We don't have to care. We just have an integer that changes over time. So we add that to our message input in the start of our block diagram. I'm not going to go back to my dodgy photo of shame. Uh, and then we uh, just make use of it. So we bring it in. Our input line, uh, we sample it, and then we just use the take function. And now, now, whenever the message comes in, whatever our limit is, that's what we trim our history to. Cool. So that's our first example of passing in a behavior as an input, as a kind of live variable that's going to be changing around. It's a pretty cool thing in FRP design to be able to just plug a hole into them in. Cool. So we had an echo you know, program, and we're OK with that. Now we're going to start moving towards a chat server. So by the end of part two, we'll have a big proper chat server with at least feature parity with the one from uh, Parallel and Concurrent Haskell. And it'll have some extra features as well. So, yeah. so with our chat server, we initially <coughs> help the user for a nickname, and once they've Given us a valid nickname, we start processing commands. They can send messages, they can send private messages, they can kick people, they can quit. Uh, in both of the phases, we prompt for a name and process commands, there are two kinds of outputs. We have the notifications, they go to everyone. You know, so and so joined the channel, and so and so sent this message, and we have a data type for it. But, you know, it's just so with nothing up my sleeve, I actually wrote the data type. And we have error messages and help messages that go only to the user that's interacting and not to everyone else. Kind of like standard out and standard error. So, ish, if you really squint. Uh, so with the notifications, we want the option to either stream them straight to the display, so just as they come in, just send them out, or batch them up until the user asks for them and then display them all. Uh, the reason we're doing this is that eventually, when we have a web-based chat server, we would have the option of web sockets, which will stream them straight, the notifications straight through. Or if they don't, the client doesn't support web sockets, we can use XHR requests to queue them all up and ask for them periodically. Uh, so three components, notification handling, uh, name prompting, command processing. Uh, for our nicknames, we want them not to be empty. There should be one word. There shouldn't be a command. That would be confusing. And they should not be the same as the nickname of any of the other users. So we have a, some dynamic content entering the game there. Uh, there'll be another block diagram photo, but there's code up here as well. I'm not actually going to go into the inside of it, because we're, then we'll go through mounds and mounds of code. But we have our IO events, our open and our read. Uh, we have a message of the day greeting string. Why not make it a behavior? It's an applicative, so you can always use pure to just hand a constant in. And this way, someone can change the message of the day string later on, and it just works. And we have the behavior of the set of names that people have already logged in. And for our output, you know, we have our write for errors, like you put in a dodgy name, 
we have the notifications, you know, Dave has joined the channel, and we have the name event. When someone has finally selected a valid name after stumbling through our validation, we fire something off saying, this is their name, they've chosen something. Ick. Anyhow, <laughs> inputs on the left, outputs on the right. For our command processing, uh, we have our read event, we have the set of names, uh, which becomes relevant for trying to kick a non-existent user, and we have a uh, behavior of the username. So this is happening after the name's been gathered, we can create a behavior. And our outputs are the usual write and the close. Uh, any, ooh, yep, that's right. any notification uh, that we might be generating from our own behaviors. And we'll also have a fetch command for fetching uh, notification history if we're in the kind of polling mode rather than the streaming mode. And a user saying, hey, we kicked this user. Uh -oh. And, yep, the less said the better. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, looking very briefly on the inside of the changes to the components here, our old friend uh, message uh, just takes in the behavior from the name so that it can create the right notification. And it outputs the notification. Dave is joined, or whatever that turns into. And we do that for more or less everything, which I won't bore you with. Notification handbook. We have two types, the streaming one or the batching one with a limit so that we don't run out of memory. Uh, and we take in an input notification and whether or not you know, someone is explicitly fetching the history. And we output a string, print out the Maybe we output something else, I didn't update the code, but it's okay. We totally output something else and print it elsewhere, that's fine. So with the streaming version, uh, we just wrap it in the list and send it out, and then convert that to a string, which I forgot to put in there. And with the batching version, it's a whole heap of code, but it's basically the message history example, uh, with a couple of differences. When you fetch, it clears the list, but that's in a behavior that's accumulating, so it's cleared in the next event which means we can use fetch to sample the history so far to get to grab that history before it gets cleared. So if you have 10 messages in the queue, you fetch, it'll grab those so you can print them out, and then it will clear the history. All right, that's our handle notifier. Lovingly crafted. Yeah, that's great. All right, uh, this is how we tie it all together. <laughs> Uh, you got a sense of what's coming already, I see. Uh, there'll be a diagram after this as well. All right. So we set up our name component. It's cool, cool. Uh, we have an ename coming out of there, and so we turn that into a behavior, which is handy because we need that to create our command processing component. Uh, and then our we have a notification coming in from the outside, and we have some coming from the outside. So that e notifier is an input, uh, which creates you know, what we want to write out about the notifications. And then we gather up all of our writes and our notifiers from the components. Cool. So in pictorial form. Ick. <laughs> but, but, you know, it is a block diagram. You can think about it this way and kind of line it all up and go, no, I should really expand that box, or you know, that's getting super awkward. Uh, in the Manning FRV book, they've got a lot more kind of diagramming disciplines. So they've got special things for a QMB and a QME, so you can really look and understand everything they're doing. Uh, these took enough time to do with pen and paper, let alone the actual diagramming tool, and even coming up with that. It's just, and some of the things later, it's just, it'd just be scribbles. And melting faces. <laughs> cool. Alright, so there's a problem here. Do I talk about it? Yeah, I'll talk about it. We have that read event going into both phases at once. So we're doing name processing and we're doing command processing at the same time. We don't want that. We want one and then the other. Which I have. First we use the name prompting, then we do the command processing. We have a few options here. The first thing we can do is just filter the inputs. Don't always pass the read through. So, with our partial monstrosity from before, and recursive do, which you all love, uh, we can 
create a little data structure talking about where we are in the process. Pre-open, name prompting, command process. And we can accumulate uh, state for on the name prompting and the command processing. And then we can build a filtered version of read based on that state. If we are name prompting, then we have this read input and we make use of it in our name component. And we do the same thing you know, if we are command processing, pass the read through, and, uh, and then use that in our command input. So we can just filter the inputs based on some state. If we've got a name, <coughs> then we're doing command processing. Cool. The second way is a little bit trickier. So this is a completely static event, program, event network. And we're just using those behaviors to wrap things around. The second way involves switching the outputs. And this is actually rewiring the graph. It's changing an output to point to someone else. Sorry. Cool. So, uh, the easiest way to count, oh, that doesn't, the colors aren't great. Uh, so, if you're switching behaviors, you have an initial behavior. And then you have an event wrapped in behaviors. And every time that fires, the payload of that event is the new behavior. So, you can switch backwards and forwards, or switch between things. You know, uh, in this case, it goes backwards and forwards once. In reactive banana, switch B doesn't have an initial value. You get nothing until the first event. In fact, you don't even get the events at the same time point as the switching event. You get them straight after the switching event, which is a little bit unfortunate, but you can work around it. But it will give you all of the events between occurrences of the switching event. So, yeah. um, other Libraries allow initial um, events for Switchy to use up until that first one. Art Reflex covers all the combinations, behavior, 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 event. They're all there, and they have well-defined semantics. Um, but I kind of just papered over all of them by making a little switch type class. Uh, take something, something wrapped in an event, gives you uh, whatever you should be looking at. Uh, behavior is a Switch B. The event one, uh, I've got it on GitHub, but you can kind of write your own using the existing primitives. Just, it's there. And then we throw in a little helper function here, which don't worry too much about what it looks like here. It just exists. This is what it's for. We have a data structure that contains a whole group of events or behaviors. We can just use this pattern to make the whole thing switch, switch all of these events and behaviors at once which is very handy. Uh, so here is a version of that from our cut down simplified version of our outputs. We have our name outputs, and we have our command processing outputs. And then we start with the name prompting outputs, and then when, it, when the name comes in, we switch to the command processing outputs. That will change, and that's the, the last line, because that's in the, the correct monad, and so it will just wire up the outputs to switch based on where you are. There's a problem with that. You need to switch out the event that does the switching. Because otherwise, because it could. I did the switch backwards and forwards, and you know, you're going to have to, you know, there's no compile function that's clever enough to work that out unless you severely limit what you can do. So some libraries have once. Uh, Rackley Banana doesn't, but you can totally have it. Start with an event. And after it occurs, never do it again. And switch, the underlying switch is clever enough to know that that never comes and so nothing's ever coming back. So, that's where we use it. We just, there's only one time that the name will change, I can see a switch, and we use that for our switch. And then things will play nicely with garbage collection. And we won't have surprising things like an earlier buggy a bit where all of my one word chatting was actually trying to change the name. <laughs> yep. A better option, uh, both for safety against those kind of things and for some GC reasons, you can filter the inputs and switch the outputs. Doesn't hurt. Um, so this is often you have various uh, implementations where you change uh, between those from event. So you could go from uh, batch notification processing to streaming and back based on some option, and switch would allow you to actually change that out 
wife. All right, the third option involves an even bigger dynamic change to the event network. And this is why we have no more diagrams. What do you do? They involve these bad boys. So moment is our builder monad for the event network. So with observe E, if we have an event carrying something that builds part of our event network that returns an A, just build that in in the background and just give me an event of A. So tell me when you're done. And it'll, you know, if that takes a while to build, the event will fire after it's built. Uh, if we have IO, then we have execute. So let's patch some stuff in, like not just changing the railroads, but we actually bolt whole new pieces in. Uh, we can build a switch for this, for the moment version anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, so the trick here is we want to switch between name, prompting, and command processing but they have different times. So we'll build a wrapper. Everything that's going to come out of any of them. Because we can only use the never event to plug any gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, this has a switch instance, and it has our little wrap things that builds output wrap things based on what we've got. Cool. Now, uh, 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 rather than using our little arrow from our do notation to bolt these things into the network that will get stuck and stay there forever, we use let to create these moment output wrappers. <coughs> they're not in the network yet, they're things that could affect the network. Uh, we have our ability to switch them, and then we will use the moment instance of switch to switch between uh, the name block and the command block once we switch. Uh, that's actually in two levels of moment because of our type class, so we use join. And then we pull the name out of our output wrapper and use that for our switch. Okay. So uh, this is, depending on the switch, this is actually live editing your graph by putting big, moving big chunks of it in and out, which is yeah, where things get interesting. So why? Would you bother with something that's going to hurt you like that? We're going to have a chat server, right? Every person that joins in, is going to, every client is going to have their own piece of the network. I mean, we could have one horrible network that can handle, oh, this read came in for this user ID, and run around and have the IDs running everywhere and try and work out, oh, you're not talking to yourself, and that's fine. But with this ability, we can actually build the, you know, like our chat server so far, build a single user network and just bolt in a copy of that into like a map, a user ID to this event network. And have that, you know, pull them out when they log out, add them in when they log in, and it gives you better composability. So you can write it and get it working for one user and then work with it over collections and things. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to go into more depth of the, the next bits in part two. So this is just a little bit of a, a talk about FLP and garbage collection, but there'll be heat profiles and lots of fun in the, the next version, because that's, yeah. Uh, so the theory is, if you don't use it, you shouldn't pay for it. That's FLP and garbage collection. Uh, it's kind of a sufficiently advanced compiler argument. That's what they should be doing. Uh, some of the libraries are more or less caught up, and it'll do what you think. Some of them, it's kind of like, we could clean that up, but just try not to do that. So, uh, so if behavior is never sampled, like never ever, it shouldn't be created. Uh, also, if we sample it using never, the compiler should be able to pick that up. If things are a bit more advanced than that, then you're going to have trouble. Uh, if an event is part, of, is part of a network that doesn't lead to I.O. on some path, you probably don't need to be firing it, so you may not be accumulating state. So that could be being collected. Uh, all based on what can be statically determined when you run the compile function to build your network. So the switch makes that tricky. Switch is one of the last additions to react to a banana before it went to the 1.0 uh, release. Because we could switch an event to become never, but then we need to be able to statically determine that it's never going to switch back, because you could have something that's just toggling away. Uh, and that's where once comes in, because once switches to never, Switch is kind of smart enough to see that you've switched to never with the thing that's switching, and so it knows that it's out. So if you use that once kind of pattern, 
then at least in quite a few libraries, like sodium for instance is enough, it'll do your GC for it. So. Uh, Reactor Banana internally uses weak references all over the place to try and enforce the correct semantics using the GHC garbage collector. So if you can reason about something, you know, it will definitely get cleaned up in regular GHC and it's not really being used, it's probably going away. So uh, in part two, I'll go a little bit further into this, but to demonstrate all of this, you can't use IO because whether IO is involved or not actually affects what gets collected or not. Uh, so yeah, it will be time known, time varying uh, patterns of memory allocation and heat profiles to watch the effects. Cool. And the other bit, uh, which will go a lot further than socket based, but you know, this is the teaser for part two, where we have multiple connections. Uh, yep, much more depth. Uh, also wrote this on the train, so it's not quite as smooth as the rest of it, but bear with me. We have some data structure with our I.O. functions. You know, write a string out, <coughs> close things. And then we have inputs, uh, input events, which have the ID of the connection. They're managed elsewhere, at least for now. So when we open, it's open with an ID, close with an ID, read with an ID of the string. <laughs> and when the client gets created, we get an, a pair of an ID and our functions to write out. Uh, we're going to be building up a behavior of client states, which is the name and the event uh, notifications. So it's going to be behavior event notification. Uh, we've already got behavior name, so we can kind of use pure and the applicative uh, stuff to build our behavior client state. So we have a magical function, make client network, that takes all of our inputs and an ID and will filter them down. So it's only getting the inputs that we need and also passes in the behavior of names instead of all usernames, and the input event notification, the thing that has just happened that we're going to tell everyone about. So if some other user is logged in or sent a message, whatever. And then we use execute, like observe e, to patch that into the network. We joined the now part of the network. All right. So that's where we begin. So there's only two weird bits left. This is one of them. So, because we have an event of a pair of integers and behavior of client states, we can accumulate that into a map. So we uncurry insert, and we can be building up our event map behavior of client state. And then every time something closes, we can use delete to pull it out. All right? And so every time something closes or something joins, this event changes. And just for an instant, it has that map. Cool. Now, Inside of that event, we can use sequence to change the map of behaviors into a behavior of maps. All right. And now we can use switch B to go from an event of behavior of maps to just a behavior of maps. We now have the behavior of all of our clients that we can sample. Just everyone who's on board can we can just say, hey, well, we can say all kinds of things like give me your names, which we do like so. Just pull the name out of the state um, throughout the map, pull out the elements, give it to a list, uh, give it to me in a set. Now we have B names, which we pipe way back around at the top um, in here when we create things. And that gets live updated as people plug in the pocket. Cool. The other bit we do is with notifications. All right, so uh, cool. all of our clients potentially have, got, have an event saying, this is a notification I want to tell them. It's just there for an instant. <clears throat> That's cool. So we can pull that out of our behavior of uh, maps of client states. And we can uh, use leftmost on that, because only one of them should be going at once, because we have a big serialized list of input events. And so we can actually get a behavior of events notifications. It's kind of like the, the notification event that is firing right now. Notifications will only be occurring if we've got an open or a read or a close from something. So these are the ones with the IDs. It's any of our clients read. It could cause a notification for us. 
So we just get an event that just fires every time something happens that could cause a notification. Now, we can use that to sample the behavior of events. Cool? Which gives us an event of events. And switch E takes an event of events and turns it into an event. So between this thing, which will, this tick, which will, could possibly cause a notification, and the next tick, whichever event is firing, it's going to pull out, and then we have, you know, Dave joined the room, Tony sent a message, just sitting there as an event that's got, that is the one that fired in this tick. And we pass that back around to the top, and then everyone can print out all of the messages. Cool. So, I, more detail later, and yeah, it's even more interesting than that, but yeah. So there's still lots more to cover. Plenty of testing goodness, although I touched on that briefly. Uh, using this event network for a web server, so running it uh, on Snap, for instance. Uh, actually, I want to use it for both, so you can connect via a socket, or you can have a web server, and it can share states, so you can have command line and web-based uh, interaction. Uh, covering the differences between reactive banana and reflex, the concepts are the same, but there's some better combinators in there. And then using reflex and reflex DOM to give it a web-based front end. So, yeah. And there's lots of other fun stuff that isn't in part two, but you know, get involved. Um, I've got some hack nut ideas for after part two, but uh, we'll get into that elsewhere. It's also fun to be had serializing and deserializing behaviors. You can bolt all your behaviors together with applicative, and if you have a save the world event, you can just sample all of your state and save it out. And then you can use that state at the start of a step up to seed the initial state. So that's kind of cool. Uh, this is kind of like event sourcing with semantics. You have a serialized list of events coming in. You, know, you can sample things to your command, query, whatever. But it's instead of it's based on theory rather than consultants. So it may be a good thing or a bad thing. I'm very interested to see what an FRP implementation of Raft would look like. Gather consensus. And I'm really interested to see what an FRP based parser library would look like. But not just incremental input, but if I apply a patch to this thing, live update the. Because if you can handle patches, you can handle people typing in editors. And you know, there's lots of fun to be had there for just small updates to large documents and just chaining updates through, say, you know, a parser, a type checker, whatever. Uh, and yep, that's it. Cool. Uh, let's end in part one. Stay tuned. Uh, questions, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. when, um, when you're doing all this composition, you sort of, like, you just start with a type and you think of the type that you want to end up with and then just apply the right operators to get to the right, or do you actually have a conceptual idea of what an event of an event of an event right. is? So like? for, for the easy stuff, I have an idea and I just kind of write it and it works and the type checker says, hurrah. And then sometimes, like for that last bit, yeah, it's like you... especially in here, I kind of wrote that it's like, first what do I bit. Want? Oh, yeah. have you, you can go, what do I want? Have you come like, across type holes before? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, I'm kind of like, I know that I needed to do something here that would do, well, what function do I need there? And I'm like, all right, do I have anything that does anything like this? And yeah, proceed it that way. But I mean, a few of these things are kind of common patterns. The examples are really thin on the ground out there. But if you flip through that Manning book, or if you muck around on GitHub and find the buried example folder, there could be something that uses, you know, a map for something, and I think there's one example of using sequence. I can find some mailing list posts where people talk about it, but it's how you deal with gathering state like that. So, yeah. So some of it you can kind of piece together from looking at what other people have done, but people are fairly quiet about it. So, yeah. And other bits, type holes or guessing or the compiler will yell at you. So, yep. so Dave, you've talked about um, <clears throat> maybe a, like a, an IO or reactive to I.O. system, um, is this kind of FRP, or these particular libraries, would you use them for, say, computation, so doing, um, like, stream processing? Uh, you could. Where you want throughput uh, yeah, um, and computation? 
opposed to just the, you know, switching I/O. Yeah, I mean, you could. You could just have your input comes in as an event, and your output is the thing you print to the screen, the screen, and then everything in between is. But I mean, maybe it, it shines when you're doing I/O, and there's probably simpler ways to do it if it's a pure computation. If you want something like FRP for computing things, look at propagators. propagators. Oh, yes. Yeah. And then when you understand them, please tell me how they work. <laughs> okay, so, I've heard of them, but I, yeah, that's, that, that's <laughs> it's like It's like the recursive do of explanations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So, way early on, we were introduced to Stepper. Yep. Which I think samples are something into a something else, or does that? Can we go back about 800 slides, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on. No. Step out of Yep. Right. So we sort of event to behavior type situation, and I think if you go to the next slide, it always happens. Just after. Directly after? Yeah. Can you please explain how directly after is a concept when we're talking about infinitely thin <coughs> slices of time? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Thanks. Not in this. Uh, so it will appear in whatever the next one is. Uh, that statement is more, it's kind of a double negative. It will not appear in this time slice. So it'll okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 affect, it, affects, it affects the state, but not in a way that's observable right now. If, what? if there wasn't another event, that next you, thing would never happen. Yeah. Like another event from outside the network, it would yeah. never happen. Because you need a button press or a key press to have a new point in time. So the next time there's a key press, you couldn't potentially observe it. So time doesn't exist unless there are events to witness it. Right? Yes. yes. <laughs> <Events Yep. happen. laughs> there are exactly as many points of time as there are external firings. Okay. So if there is no other firing after this one, then there is no accumulated behavior you can't, well, effectively, because you can't observe it. Right. So, uh, so effectively, it sort of means between this event and the next event, in the sort of non-time that doesn't happen between them, this yep. will be updated. Yeah. So there's a reactive, uh, one of the three diagrams in the reactive banana docs is, uh, going, is step, it's going from event, which is, in their diagrams, a whole heap of points against time values. And then for stepper, it shows the behavior where it's just lines going from what, what, from that value, it just continues, except it's a half open interval. So it's like starting at the next point, that's where that value kicks along from. Okay. Yeah. So that's the kind of the continuous time interpretation of that is it's kind of a half open interval where the new value starts in the next kind of time step on the kind of square wave thingy. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, I feel like I missed an opportunity to use tiny whiny stuff in there, which I was hoping to do at some point. Have, there's, have, have there been any work like to be able to annotate your network and get a nice diagram out of your problem? Uh, I've talked about that with Ryan somewhat. But that would be beautiful, but the whole switching of networks and stuff. Yeah, you need a good diagramming discipline that maps well to the semantics so it doesn't lead you astray. Yeah. And Reactive Banana has that uh, that compilation step, so you describe this, mm. and then it builds it into all of these, it does other things for running on it. Which yeah. means my initial attempts to heat profile things by setting up weak references and finding out when things disappear, things disappear when you compile, because they're gone. Nice. It's just a description. Yeah. So you have a concrete description that you could turn into a diagram if you were happy enough. Ryan's open to the idea, but he doesn't. You'd have to add another layer that kind of describes things on yeah. top. Yeah, yeah. I've I've thought about this, but and it would be good, especially if you could have something which kind of visually corresponds to the semantics. Yeah, that would be pretty nice. Because you get you quickly get to a world where you get to where you get in Erlang, where you can just log into the VM and check mailboxes. Like you can inspect the state of the system. Yeah. Whereas here, you can't see it. You can't inspect anything nicely. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you could build functionality to do that, like the ability to snapshot sure. behaviors. But that's yeah. that's the FRP equivalent to putting print lines in your code. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
the FRP equivalent of putting print lines in your code. It's putting print lines in your code. <laughs> <laughs> the, number, the number, like, especially in reactive banana, it's like, oh, what's going on here? Oh, I've got an event. Is it firing? Reactor made, put string line, bam. Just everywhere. And then back it out and go to a pure, like, go from um, moment IO to moment when you clean it up. Yeah. 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 That, that's when you know you're done cleaning. It's like, oh, everything's pure again. <laughs> I've looked at reactive banana, but is it is, is an analogy of, about how it works? Is every <clears throat> every every event, every, every input, every time something is triggered, you're getting an output and a new version of the machine, and then you loop around again? Uh, not necessarily, because it could be uh, filtered out. It's generally a in reactive banana, it's a network of pulses and latches. <coughs> so your memory and stepper is done with the latch. And pulses are the things that. It's like a pulse of electricity going through to trigger a change. So it's not always giving you an update on the output because it's actually internally almost stateful. Well, it's kind of got a stateful yeah. kind of strict network on the inside. Yeah. So it's actually, it is a big graph effectively. But, yeah. Yeah. If that makes any sense at all. So what you're saying is we can take this and turn it into barrel lock. Yeah. And in fact, Connell Elliott, who came up with this, uh, had a startup based around doing hardware from FRP. Uh, well, and then based on category theory, because it's a, uh, circuits are a closed Cartesian category, and he went on and did all kinds of crazy stuff. And you can kind of see echoes of that in his recent uh, FFT, generic FFT work, which is kind of cool. What happened to that startup? It failed. Or, yeah, it, it stopped. Yeah. The next event going to kill Man, that's half a shot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> event burn. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I look forward to the reflex side of things because yeah. if anybody's excited about things like flux or redox in React land, this is it with types and nice semantics and beautiful yeah. goodness. Oh, and the Dju branch is coming out soon for GHCGS, which will cut the output by about 40%. Mm. And that's not the aggressive code size branch. That's the intermediate kind of step. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Very exciting times. Cool. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you.